Hey creeps, I'm Taylor and this is TGI Crime Day. Hello and welcome to TGI Crime Day. I just wanted to give you a quick heads up in case this is your first time on this channel or even if it's not your first time on this channel. Generally, my videos are videos and there are visual components to them where I talk to the camera and I show you pictures and things like that. This episode is one that I recorded before I had my YouTube channel, so this one is going to be an audio only version, but I do like this episode a lot and so I wanted to put it on my YouTube channel as well. So, just so you know, usually we do have video around here, but for this episode, uh, we don't. So, subscribe, check out the other videos, and you can kind of see how this normally works. Uh, but let's get into today's case. Hello, and welcome to episode 21. So, I went and saw House of Gucci twice. Uh, I'm obsessed with it. The second I left, I was like, I have to read the book, and I have to do a podcast about this immediately. If you haven't seen House of Gucci yet, obviously there are spoilers ahead. Uh, the movie was gorgeous and full of beautiful clothing and beautiful acting and sexual chemistry that was just off the charts. <laughs> um, so I went down the investigable rabbit hole looking up everything I could about the true story of the Gucci's and it's absolutely just as wild as the movie was. This case is fascinating. Uh, the best way I can describe it is this. It's like the ultra-rich, glamorous, Italian version of Tiger King. And what I mean by that is that everyone is sneaky and has one hand in the drama while the other hand is pointing a finger at someone else for being a terrible person. The movie was, of course, incredible. Uh, Lady Gaga is my ultimate idol and everyone else did a good job too, I guess. Just kidding. Everyone was great. Um, so also, before we get into it, your usual reminders to follow me on Instagram and TikTok. I'm trying to post more mini stories between full-length episodes on social media, so you can find me at TGI Crime Day on TikTok and Instagram, and then also reminder to send me all your ghost stories, hometown murder cases, case recommendations, the case that got you interested in true crime. I want to hear all of it. Send those to me um, in an email uh, to TGICrimeDay at gmail.com. Let's kick off this case with a quote from Jenny Garwood Gucci, the ex-wife of Paolo Gucci. She summed up the craziness of the Gucci story perfectly, quote, What you have to understand about the Gucci's is that they are all completely mad, incredibly manipulative, and not very clever. They have to be in control, but as soon as they get what they want, they crush it. As we all know, mega fashion empires don't just start overnight. So, once upon a time, in 1899, also, a quick disclaimer that I will do my very best to get the pronunciation right of all of these Italian names and places. Um, I, I swear I'm trying, and I really don't want to ruin them, but I cannot make any guarantees that I will not completely slaughter the pronunciations. Okay, moving on. So, Guccio sometimes worked as a bellhop, basically. It was his job to get the luggage out of the carriages of the rich and classy hotel guests. After throwing luggage around for a while, Guccio started to notice how poorly made some of the trunks and bags were, and so he decided to move back home to Florence, Italy, where his dad worked as a leather craftsman and started making leather luggage that was both beautiful and practical. In 1921, Guccio founded the official House of Gucci, which he wanted to keep small and a, more of a local business that was very exclusive. Inclusive. Inclusive? Exclusive. Anyways, in Florence. Oh, fun fact that I just learned while doing this research. That's why the Gucci logo is the double G because of Gucci o Gucci, which is something I never knew. Uh, his idea was that beautiful leather goods that they made would be very exclusive for people in the know. However, his, as his sons got older, it turned into a family business, and the boys wanted to expand and make that money, baby. Uh, Guccio and his wife, Ada, had five sons and one daughter. Four of their sons held high positions in the Gucci company. That was Vasco, Aldo, Hugo, and Rodolfo. In 1938, Aldo insisted that they expand Gucci, so they opened a second location in Rome. In 1951, they opened another store in Milan, and Guccio still really wanted to keep it at least an Italian-based company, and again, his sons said absolutely not. Only two weeks before Guccio Gucci passed away, his sons opened a Gucci boutique in New York. The two main brothers who stayed in the Gucci business the longest were Aldo and Rodolfo. Aldo was the one who was really big on expanding Gucci. He had a great eye for marketing, and especially in the U.S. 
1952, Aldo spearheaded the opening of the New York Boutique. President John F. Kennedy called Aldo the first Italian ambassador of fashion. He had a degree in economics and was very business savvy and was given an honorary degree from the university, no, the City University of New York for his philanthropic accomplishments. And even more impressive than any of his other accomplishments, he was called the Michelangelo of merchandising. Aldo was all about expansion. He wanted Gucci stores everywhere. Aldo married a woman named Allen, and they had three sons together, Giorgio, Paolo, and Roberto. While he was traveling the world and expanding Gucci, he was also expanding the boundaries of his marriage and had an affair with a woman named Bruna, and they had a daughter together in 1963. He married Bruna in 1981, but didn't want to go through that boring mess of divorce, so he just had, like, two families, and it was fine, and it was a secret for a long time, but eventually, you know, secrets come out. So, the other Gucci brother who ruled the empire was Rodolfo Gucci. While Aldo had been very invested in the Gucci family business, Rodolfo had other things that he wanted to pursue. When he was 17 years old, a director named Alfred Lind discovered Rodolfo on the streets of Italy and said, hey, kid, you're gonna be a star. And he was. Rodolfo was very handsome and made a name for himself during the silent film era. He was in more than 40 films during his acting career. While he was working on one of these films, a comedy called Together in the Dark, sounds very sexy, sexy, he met Sandra Ravel. They fell madly in love, got married, and had a son that they named Maurizio after Rodolfo's stage name. In 1952, Rodolfo left his acting career and rejoined the family business after his father passed away. Sadly, two years later, in 1954, his wife passed away um, from uterine cancer. When Sandra died, their son Maurizio was only five years old, old, so Rodolfo was going to do the single dad fashion maiden thing, as one does. Rodolfo did very well for himself in the Gucci business. In 1974, Aldo and Rodolfo divided the business 50-50. With each brother being a 50-50 shareholder, that meant that their sons would have a piece of that pie. However, Rodolfo only had one son, Maurizio, which meant that he would inherit 50%, while Aldo had three sons who would have to split that 50% three, way, three ways. Inheritance money sure does bring out the worst in people, and this was where the first of the Gucci family drama began. Aldo's sons basically didn't think it was fair that Rodolfo had 50% ownership and that their cousin Maurizio would get so much more than them because they felt that Rodolfo hadn't contributed enough to the business since he'd been focused on creating an acting career. So Aldo took the Gucci name and set up a perfume subsidiary to make that money for him and his three sons. This was the next blow up in the family feud and certainly not the last. Maurizio Gucci was part of the family business from a young age, and he worked as a teenager as a package delivery boy. He started to learn the ropes from his dad, Rodolfo, and was basically being trained to take over his part of the family business someday. When Maurizio was in his early 20s, he went to a fancy schmancy rich people party in Milan, and there he was dazzled by a beautiful woman. The story goes that he asked his friend, quote, who is that beautiful girl dressed in red that looks like Elizabeth Taylor? Which I just love. What a beautiful thing to say. Uh, this woman was Patrizia Reggiani. The story of how they met according to Patrizia. Quote, I met Maurizio at a party and he fell madly in love with me. I was exciting and different. Always humble, that Patrizia. I didn't think much of him at first. He was just the quiet boy whose teeth crossed over at the front. End quote. Patrizia had her options open, girl. But Maurizio won her over and they had this whirlwind romance. Like I said, if House of Gucci is the rich Italian Tiger King... Patrizia Reggiani is kind of the Carol Baskin of the situation. So, these two lovebirds are doing their thing, but Rodolfo was not having it. He felt that Patrizia was a social climber who was only interested in Maurizio's money. To which I say, if their sexual chemistry was as hot as it was portrayed on screen by Gaga and Adam Driver, money had nothing to do with it. Moving on. Uh, on top of their obvious connection and love for each other, Patrizia didn't need his money. Her father owned a huge trucking company and spoiled her with fast cars like and diamond shoes or whatever rich people have, I don't know. Her family was very wealthy, but they weren't part of the social elite circle. Which is funny because in the movie, they painted her very differently. They don't mention that her father was like rolling in money. They created a character who was very lovable and kind and sort of an outsider who was super charming. Um, but that was stretching the truth a little bit. It definitely makes for a better storyline. Anyways. Rodolfo told Maurizio that either he left Patrizia or he left the family business, and Maurizio chose Patrizia. Maurizio packed his things and left, and here's why I don't think it was about the money, at least in the beginning. Patrizia was fine with him not having the Gucci money. 
However, she always felt that Maurizio would eventually go back to inherit what she felt was rightfully his. In the meantime, Patrizia's father gave Maurizio a job at his trucking company, and the couple was still insanely happy together, just living their best lives. They got married in 1972, a ceremony that Rodolfo did his very best to stop. Later that year, Uncle Aldo reached out to the couple and asked them to meet with him. Aldo didn't have much faith in any of his sons to run the company and knew that he needed to get Maurizio back in the fold or the company would be screwed. Maurizio and Patrizia moved to New York to work for Aldo. During their time in New York, Maurizio and Patrizia became kind of the it couple. They were beautiful together and doing all of these fancy rich people things like hanging out with Jackie O and the Kennedy clan and throwing super lavish parties. In 1976, Maurizio and Patrizia had their first daughter, Alessandra, who was named after Maurizio's mother. In 1980, they had their second daughter, Allegra. Once they had the girls, Maurizio patched things up with Rodolfo. And for a short time, things were going really well at Gucci. Unfortunately for the Guccis, the good times stopped rolling in the 1980s when a series of family feuds broke out yet again. Around this time, Aldo's sons were getting to an age where they were wanting to start taking over Gucci and making more of the decisions in the company. Aldo's son Paolo really wanted to expand the company and update some old ideas, and he said, quote, to bring in other financial backers and make the business run on more modern... But the Guccis have medieval concepts of business, so I became the black sheep. Paolo decided to start his own line using the Gucci name and filed a lawsuit to sue Gucci for financial compensation. Aldo saw this as a huge betrayal, and the board voted Paolo off the island. He was fired in 1980. Paolo started designing for his own line, and the Gucci company spent $8 million to block him from being able to use the Gucci name. To put that into perspective, that's about $27 million in today's money. The Gucci company did end up hiring Paolo back and made some major changes to the company, offered him a better position and more money, as long as he dropped his lawsuits, stopped trying to create his own Gucci brand, and quit making a racket about the company finances that weren't adding up. I think basically they were just trying to get Paolo to quit pursuing his own thing by making him think they were on his side by letting him back in. They presented him with this whole idea that he would have a say in designs and would be allowed to bring more of his own ideas to Gucci. He was hesitant at first but decided it was his best option. As soon as Paolo was back in the company, it turned very quickly. He wasn't allowed to make his own designs and he wasn't really allowed to say in anything. And remember that Aldo had his two wives at the same time thing going on? He had a daughter with his second wife and his daughter, Patricia, not to be confused with Maurizio's wife, Patrizia, Patricia was appointed a high-up position in the Gucci company. She was only 19 at the time in 1982, and Aldo hired her as his, quote, official roving ambassador. I'm not entirely sure what that means, uh, but Paolo was not super happy about it. At a company board meeting, Paolo said he basically wanted to start voice recording their meetings, and everyone lost their minds. Probably because some shady business stuff was being done behind closed doors. More on that in a moment. Basically, a full-on brawl broke out because of this, and three days later, Paolo filed a lawsuit for $15 million, saying that his brothers, Giorgio and Roberto, and his cousin Maurizio had assaulted him. Quote, at the behest and instigation of Aldo, end quote. And that his contract wasn't being upheld as a Gucci shareholder because he hadn't been allowed to look at the company financial reports. When the lawsuit was filed, Aldo's response was that his son Paolo liked to exaggerate and, quote, who is the father who has never given a slap to a reckless son? Paolo was 51, and Aldo was 77 at this time, which is a bit too old for spankings. So that's just assault, my guy. Also, let's touch on this topic for a quick... I feel like the House of Gucci movie did Paolo dirty. Like, I loved his character, it, but he was ridiculous and over the top and added, like, this level of fun kind of craziness. But they also represented him as being this, like, bumbling, talentless idiot, which I feel like was kind of unfair. For the other characters, I feel like they did very a pretty good job, I think, um, making them closer to, like, the real-life people. But Paolo, man, they went full scent into making him look like such a moron. And I get it's Hollywood, everything is exaggerated, but seriously. Anyways, please go over to Instagram and let's discuss this movie over there because I want to know your guys' opinion. Okay, back to the true story. Paolo basically decided that if he couldn't join the family, he was going to take them down. Paolo started to realize that Gucci was making a ton of money on their financial statements, and they were just, like, rolling in it, but somehow, on their taxes, they were saying that they were making hardly any profits. Paolo began digging into everything and discovered that there was a whole mess of tax evasion and offshore accounts. He did what he felt he was pushed to do and turned over all of this to the authorities. So... Paolo is trying to take down the Gucci empire. Meanwhile, Rodolfo and Aldo have a feud of their own going on. 
There was basically a tug of war over shares and what kind of inheritance they would each have to pass on to their sons, and Rodolfo had been diagnosed with cancer and was going through chemotherapy and wanted to kind of get things in order for his son Maurizio, who wasn't as involved in Gucci as he would have liked. Maurizio was living in New York working with Aldo, but he wasn't really in the business the way that Aldo's sons were. Rodolfo and Maurizio put aside their past issues and presented themselves as a united front with Patrizia by Maurizio's side. This was a great move for her because suddenly, Patrizia found herself in a lot more control over Gucci than she ever planned. Maurizio and Patrizia moved back to Milan uh, with their daughters, and Rodolfo took a step back to allow Maurizio to get his feet wet in the business. Aldo stepped in and began teaching Maurizio everything he knew about marketing and the business. In 1983, Rodolfo passed away, leaving his 50% of Gucci to Maurizio. Before he passed, Rodolfo allegedly warned his daughter-in-law, Patrizia, quote, Once he gets money and power, he will change, end quote and change he did. Maurizio, who was 35 when his dad died, really didn't have the business experience or the life experience to run a company, especially with one as that has as much drama as Gucci. His uncle Aldo tried to warn Maurizio not to fly too close to the sun when Maurizio looked to him for support with all of his expansion ideas. Maurizio thought, like Paolo thought, that Aldo's ideas for Gucci were old-fashioned. He decided that if he couldn't get Aldo's blessing, he would just go around him. This became a lot easier when things finally came out about the tax evasion Paolo was digging into. To put it simply, Gucci had several offshore accounts that they were putting money into and hadn't claimed over $11 million of revenue, which is about $37 million in today's money. He was also writing company checks to himself for a ton of money, and there was just financial fraud in every part of the Gucci business. One of the Gucci's lawyers... Um, Domenico, Domenico de Soleil tried to warn Aldo about what would happen if he didn't get it together and get this all squared away, but Aldo didn't want to hear it. Domenico was pretty close with Rodolfo before he died, and so he went to Maurizio and told him what was going on and basically said if Aldo doesn't get this under control, he could take everyone down with him. Maurizio saw yet another opening to get in and take over the company, so he decided to form an alliance with Paolo, who was still pissed at this point, and battling to have his own company. Paolo had burned through the money he made in the lawsuits he filed. He basically convinced him that they would go into a business together where Paolo could have the freedom he always wanted if Paolo sold Maurizio his 3% of Gucci. It was a promise of making Paolo the vice president and designer of a sister brand to Gucci where Paolo would have all of this freedom. The cousins shook hands and got the ball rolling. Paolo sold his 3% for $20 million and that 3% was enough to put Maurizio into the power position in Gucci. Eventually, the IRS got involved and looked into all of this because Paolo handed over the documents that showed all of this shady business that had been going on, and in 1986, Aldo, who was 81, was sentenced to one year and one day in prison with a year of community service and five years probation. He went quietly and told the press he was sorry and that he forgave Paolo for blowing the whistle. With Aldo out of the way, Maurizio was now in the power position. He was the majority shareholder, so his vote was heavier than anyone else's. Like I mentioned before, Maurizio had a lot of good ideas, but not a great mind for business. Gucci was being overshadowed by new and upcoming luxury brands, and people were just getting bored of Gucci. Maurizio saw that they needed to make some major changes if they were going to keep up. He ended up firing a bunch of people who had been with Gucci for years and hired Domenico de Soleil as his CEO which I can't imagine his cousins were super happy about, and uh, they got to work restoring and updating Gucci. Just like his father had warned Patrizia, Maurizio did start to turn into a different person. Patrizia really did her best to push him to take full control of Gucci, which Maurizio did, and she might have thought that pushing Maurizio to take over the company would get her a big share of the pie for herself, but that is not what happened. Maurizio began to pull away from his marriage and his kids. He didn't have time for Patrizia or their daughters. Patrizia did her best to stay involved in Gucci. Uh, she was a big part of turning Maurizio against his cousins and uncle. And Domenico said, quote, She set him up against his uncle, his cousins, or anybody else she didn't feel was treating him properly. At Gucci events, she would say things like, I didn't get offered champagne first. That means they don't respect you. End quote. She tried to be super involved, and for Maurizio, that became suffocating. Which, sorry dude, you have a wife and children, you can't just like do the big wig thing and act like you're single and spend millions of dollars on art and car and boats. Which, what is it with people, with rich people and yachts? Anyways, <laughs> their marriage started to fall apart. Patrizia said, quote, he stopped coming home for lunch. He gained weight and dressed badly. Maurizio stopped telling me things. His tone grew detached. We spoke less. We grew cold and impassive with each other, end quote. I have a hard time not feeling a tiny bit bad 
for Patrizia, I think it's the Libra in me, okay? I have to see everything from everyone's perspective. But at the same time, she acted really greedy. And then, of course, moving forward, I stopped feeling bad pretty quick. But for a second, while she's trying to keep her marriage together and Maurizio is not interested, I felt bad. However, like I said before, everyone involved starts acting real greedy and we swing all the way over into reality TV style drama. So, it's 1985. Everyone's hair is huge. Gucci cells are not huge. One day, Maurizio packed a suitcase for a business trip to Florence, and a few days later, he sent one of his friends to inform Patrizia that he wanted a divorce. Yikes a bikes. What a child. He said that Maurizio had freedom for the first time in his life because his dad had controlled him until he was 30, and Patrizia controlled him after that. Fair enough. Spread your wings. But personally, I think it speaks a lot to his actual character and was extremely immature and really lame that he couldn't have bothered to just have a conversation. To make matters worse, Maurizio didn't want to discuss this divorce at all, but he requested that Patrizia still attended events with him and kept up appearances. Insanity. Patrizia was devastated, but agreed to this weird arrangement in the hopes that she could win Maurizio back. Unfortunately for her, there would be no winning him back. By the time he asked for a divorce, Maurizio had been having an affair for at least a year with an American woman named Cherie McLaughlin. I can't figure out if it's Sherry or Cherie. It's spelled S-H-E-R-E-E. -E. That seems like Cherie, right? We're going to go with Cherie. Maurizio met her at a yacht racing competition. Seriously, the Richies and their yachts. Oh, maybe it's because lanky blonde 26-year-olds hang out around yachts, and that's why all the Richies like them so much. Anyway, <laughs> Maurizio met Cherie, and they just couldn't resist each other. The waves, the expensive boats, the diamond-crusted toilet paper, or whatever it is that's so special about yachts. The affair began, and eventually they both got divorced from their current spouses and began an actual relationship. Listen, relationships are not like jobs. You don't get to start looking for a new, better one before giving your two weeks. You know what I mean? Patrizia and Maurizio separated in 1985, but it took years of back and forth to get them to come to an agreement on a divorce settlement. Every offer Maurizio's lawyers made, Patrizia turned down. Eventually, they landed on $1.5 million a year in alimony, which I read somewhere Patrizia called a mere plate of lentils. $1.5 million, and she's complaining. Um... I think she still wasn't satisfied. She was known for also saying, quote, I'd rather cry in a Rolls Royce than laugh on a bicycle, end quote. A lot of lengthy court battles ensued, and these two fought like crazy. In court, a voicemail that Patrizia left for Maurizio was played, and she said, quote, you've reached the extreme limit of making yourself despised by your daughters who no longer want to see you to forget the trauma. You are a deformed outgrowth. You are a painful appendix that all of us want to forget. For you, hell is yet to come end quote. Maurizio and Cherie continued their relationship for a few years, but eventually they broke up when the long distance back and forth thing just became too much. Maurizio had a thing for a beautiful blonde woman and began dating Paola Franchi around 1990. The press accused Paola of being a gold digger, to which she said, quote, oh, they always resort to these stupid types. Actually, my previous husband, whom I left for Maurizio, was even richer, so it was all nonsense. Oh, okay. Uh, later, Patrizia said of when talking about Paola, quote, when it came to green-eyed blondes happy to walk three steps behind, he'd had plenty. Petty. Pettiness. The pettiness is off the charts. I just can't help myself. It's all so ridiculous. Okay. Um, I wanted to include that so that you guys could kind of see how Patrizia was handling the situation. Not well, okay? After the divorce was finalized, she was not supposed to use Gucci as her last name anymore, but she did. And for the next decade, she would still call Maurizio her husband, and anytime she had to talk about Paola, she called her, quote, that woman. <laughs> Again, the pettiness. As Maurizio worked to update Gucci and get to a point where it could keep up with the rest of the luxury fashion houses, he decided it was time to completely cut the rest of the Gucci family from the business. In 1988, Maurizio worked with an investment company called Investcor to buy out Aldo and his sons, so they no longer held any shares in Gucci. Maurizio hired Don Mello to help him turn Gucci around, and together they cut 70% of the Gucci products and closed 82% of their stores in order to make Gucci really exclusive and hard to get again. To keep the brand moving forward and feeling fresh, Don Mello, who said at this time, quote, no one would dream of wearing Gucci, end quote, hired a promising new designer, Tom frickin' Ford, okay, who at this time was brand new to the scene and decided to take the job that no one else seemed to want. For those of you who don't know, Tom Ford is a really huge, um, very popular luxury brand currently, and he started with Gucci, so this was like his first time on the scene. 
So, um, Tom Ford was hired as the women's ready-to-wear designer, and suddenly, everyone started to love Gucci again. The public response to Tom Ford's new designs was overwhelmingly positive, and this did not make Maurizio very happy, which is weird, because you'd think he'd be glad that things were going well, um, but he didn't really love what he was doing. Don Mello said, quote, Maurizio always wanted everything to be round and brown, and Tom wanted to make it square and black. For a while, Maurizio wanted to fire Tom Ford, but Domenico advised him against it. He trusted Domenico, so he didn't keep pushing, and he let Tom Ford stay. Don Mello and Tom basically transformed Gucci into a different, much more loved brand, and Maurizio eventually got himself into trouble for spending all the company's money. In 1993, Investcore decided that they were done with Maurizio and pushed him out. They didn't really give him a choice, and he had to sell his 50% of the company for somewhere between $150 and $200 million. And after the decades of fighting and legal battles and trade wars and drama, there was no longer anyone from the Gucci family working at Gucci. On March 27th, 1995, Maurizio showed up to his private office in Milan. He was greeted by the doorman Giuseppe, and suddenly a man appeared holding a gun. Maurizio was shot three times in the back and once in the head. Giuseppe rushed over to him and was also shot twice in the arm. Um, Giuseppe did survive. He just had injuries. And the man jumped into a car that sped away, and Maurizio died in Giuseppe's arms. After Maurizio's death, police assumed it was a hired hitman, but they couldn't pinpoint who had hired them. I'm assuming they looked at everyone in the Gucci family because of all the feuds and drama. The employees at Maurizio's new company he'd started didn't have any ideas of who could have done it, and for two years, there were no real leads. However, it wasn't long before everyone started turning to Patrizia for answers. It was not a secret that she was loudly complaining to anyone who would listen to her about her issues with Maurizio. Apparently, she asked her housekeeper twice if she would help her kill him, and she consulted a lawyer, just hypothetically, to ask what would happen if she got rid of her ex-husband. It was pretty widely known that she was asking around about hiring a hitman. Maurizio's girlfriend, Paola, said that they had been planning to get married around this time, and she knew that, Parisi that Patrizia was stalking them. She told Maurizio to hire a bodyguard, but he brushed her off and said that he didn't think Patrizia would actually do anything because of their daughters. Unfortunately, Patrizia didn't care about anyone but herself, so nothing was going to stop her. I can't imagine that people weren't already super suspicious of Patrizia because of the way she acted right after Maurizio's death. Within three hours of Maurizio's murder, Patrizia filed a legal claim to get Maurizio's apartment and arrived that afternoon to kick Paola out, and she had to just leave. At the funeral, Patrizia wore black sunglasses and a veil and said, quote, On a human level, I am sorry. On a personal level, I can't say the same thing. Yikes. An anonymous tip was called into the police in 1997, and the truth came out. Patrizia enlisted the help of her best friend Pina, who had been described as many different things, from a tarot card reader to a psychic to a sorcerer. Whatever she was, she sounds like she was freaking cool. Before plotting murder, of course. Uh, Pina was Patrizia's best friend. She told her everything, and eventually, Patrizia enlisted Pina's help in hiring a hitman to get rid of Maurizio. Together, they hired a hitman and a getaway driver for $370,000. As soon as she got caught... Patrizia tried to say she was innocent, that she'd been framed, that it was all Pina's idea, etc. She said, quote, I have to admit that for a time, I truly wanted to get rid of him. I wanted to do it, and so I was going around asking people to do it. But my intentions ended there. A mere obsession, a mere desire. What wife has never said, I'd kill that guy, end quote? Yikes. A lot of wives, most wives probably haven't said that. Patrizia's defense lawyer did their best to come up with different reasons why Patrizia was innocent, including trying to get her ruled, like, not competent to stand trial because she'd had a brain tumor removed in 1992, and they tried to say that this brain tumor injury um, was why she had acted irrationally. But we all know that the irrational acts started long before this. There were a few items of evidence that did not help her case, including a diary entry where Patrizia wrote, quote, There is no crime that money cannot buy. And on the day that Maurizio was murdered, she wrote one word, paradisios, which is Greek for paradise. Once Pina realized her friend was going to throw her under the bus, she turned on Patrizia and told the police everything. Pina said, quote, She is evil. My life has been completely ruined by that woman. I thought Patrizia was a fun and exciting person when we first met, but now I see that she is a shallow narcissist who only cares about money and will step on anyone to get what she wants, end quote. She also revealed that Patrizia bought her funeral outfit weeks before the murder happened. It's really odd because it seems like Patrizia was trying to argue her innocence and act like she had nothing to do with it, but she was also a little braggy. It's like she wanted 
like the credit and the spotlight for having Maurizio killed because she's such a narcissist that she wants it to be about her. Um, and she even said, quote, the murder was worth every lira. Okay, I'm sorry. This is where the names get really tricky. In 1998, Benedetto Cerullo, who was the person who pulled the trigger, was convicted of murdering Maurizio and was sentenced to life in prison. The getaway driver, Orazio Saikala, was sentenced to 29 years. Ivano Savioni was acting as the negotiator between Pina and the hitman, and he was given 26 years. Pina was sentenced to 26 years, and Patrizia was sentenced to 29 years in prison. After serving just 16 years of her 29-year sentence, Patrizia was released in 2014 on the condition that she would have to get a job. She actually had been offered the same deal in 2011, but opted to stay in prison because, quote, I've never worked in my life and I'm certainly not going to start now, end quote. Clearly, she changed her tune in 2014 and went with the work release offer. She was 67 years old when she was released and celebrated by going shopping in Milan, wearing expensive jewelry with a pet parrot on her shoulder. This woman is unbelievable. Patrizia was hired by Beaux-Arts, where she was their jewelry and bag designer and helped them to curate their Instagram. She gave interviews and complained about the shame of having to wear Zara. Not Zara, can you imagine? Meanwhile, I'm crying because Zara price tags are sometimes too high for myself anyways. She had to wear Zara because her daughters have complete. As I'm sure you can imagine, the paparazzi and reporters followed her everywhere. Once, after a long day of being followed around, she was really frustrated and they caught her in a bad mood. And one of the paparazzi asked her why she'd hired a hitman and not just kill Maurizio herself. And she yelled back, quote, my eyesight is not so good. I didn't want to miss, end quote. Clearly, she has absolutely no remorse for anything and has even said that she would like to go back to work for Gucci, saying, quote, they need me. I still feel like a Gucci. In fact, the most Gucci of them all. End quote. <laughs> what a wild ride this has been. Um, I would really love to hear your thoughts about this case and about the movie. Go talk to me over on Instagram. I feel like I'm just constantly talking at you, and I know that's what a podcast is, but I would also really love response. So, um, go follow me on Instagram at TGI Crime Day and let's discuss. I hope that you liked this episode and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening. Bye!